Hello everyone, I'm Jeff Costa and this week we are going to be talking about gotchas when you inherit tenants on a property. So there's a long running debate of whether it's good or bad to have tenants in place when you purchase a property. If you have tenants in place already, that's great. You have instant cash flow. You don't have to worry about the property being vacant and not being able to have money to make your mortgage payment. On the flip side, when you inherit tenants, you don't know anything about them, right? You're not the one who selected them. You don't know how they've been screened for credit or criminal activity, and you don't know their payment history. So I like to actually mix and find a middle ground between these. Uh, in the last duplex that I purchased, uh, the top was vacant, which was great because it let me remodel it. And there was an existing tenant who I know wanted to stay because she expressed that sentiment to her to the real estate agent uh, who was selling the property. So we ended up using the binder method to bring her up to market rents and it worked perfectly. We went from a thousand dollar monthly rent to a 1250 market rent, which is still a little bit below market for the area, but I didn't want to press that, right? I really appreciated the fact that she wanted to stay. She was already a long-term tenant. She was re-screened under uh, my new property manager and passed with flying colors. So, you know, next year I can raise the rent $50 uh, or whatever mar the market rate is at that point in time. But for now, she covers about 90% of the mortgage payment on the house, which is great. So when you're evaluating a house, though, there's something that you should pay attention to, and that is the existing rent roll. And here we're looking at a, 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 a house in Rochester, New York, and it's the one you see here on the screen. We're looking at what's called One Home, which is most real estate agents' new interface to the MLS system. And I'm gonna scroll down here um, to the section called Property Details. If you're having your agent send you listings, you probably are familiar with this interface, right? One of the things you wanna definitely look at is Open Property Details. They're gonna tell you about the interior and exterior of the property right here. But here, this tells you about the monthly rent, right? So this is really interesting and good information because here I'm seeing that this is a quadplex, right? And the rents, as you can see here, are all over the map, right? I've got rents for a 2-1 at 900, uh, at 1,000, and then there's a $100 difference between those. And then there's a $240 difference between the three one units. So the one thing you wanna do here is you wanna go to Rentometer and you wanna plug in the property details and determine if these are under or over market rents. So here I'm gonna scroll back up and I'm just gonna pick up the actual address, go to Rentometer, plug in that address, it finds it, and then I'm gonna look at a 2-1, right? Which is again, if I go back here, well, I have two two ones and two three ones. So let's see what they say for a 2-1. Well, here the average rent is 1287 and the median is 1325. Let's go back over here for the 2-1. I have 1,000 and 900. Both of these are substantially under what you would call market rents. Rentometer is actually doing a look back here three months. So, you know, at the 25th percentile, right, which means 75% are higher than this number, they're at 970, right, which you can easily see, but 1,000 and 900, we're below market. So, Let's plug in the three bedroom at the same address, click analyze and see what we see. Here we see a, another discrepancy, right? Uh, 1700 average and a median of 1500 or 1490 if you're being specific, but look where we are, right? We're below market here by a few hundred. We're below market here substantially, right? 1100 versus 1700. So, 
you know, you would want as a as a landlord, you know, this is a, an opportunity for you to raise rents and make even more money on the property, right? Because these are all substantially below market. Now, the thing you have to keep in mind here is and ask yourself, how long are these leases in place, right? Which is why you get a document like this from the listing agent. This is something that in Rochester, they show you the rent schedule. And that's what you're seeing right here, right? Those numbers across here align with what you just saw, right, in the MLS listing. But what you wanna pay attention to is, is this a written lease or an oral lease? In this case, all written, which is great, it's on paper. But the big one is the lease term and the last day of the lease term. Here we have a lease term that's month to month for this unit, which means it might be easier to get this tenant out. Uh, you would still probably have to uh, at least budget for 90 days to do that, right? But here you have a couple of problems, right? I have a tenant on a six month lease, which is goes to June of 2023 which means they probably just signed this uh, not long ago. And what this is telling you is for the unit that is 1340, you are going to have to wait until June of next year. We're recording this in September, right? So they just signed this lease, most likely. You have to wait six months to be able to raise the rates to market rent right? Because this lease is in place. And for the next unit, it gets a little worse, right? You have a year lease in place that doesn't expire until July, the end of July of 2023. So you have to be comfortable accepting $1,100 in rent until the end of July, which might negatively impact your cash flow when market rents are 1700 as we saw from Rentometer. And then finally, you see the same problem here with the fourth unit, right? This one's even lower, right? This is the $1,000. And this one goes even longer, right? You have to wait till the, uh, I'm sorry, it doesn't go even longer. This one goes to the end of October, right? So this one is probably the, 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 the one that has the most proximity to be changed, right? So I can effectively move at least one of these, most likely to a higher rent, right? To market rent. But it's unclear whether my I can do that for the month to month. It's likely that you can. But I also have to kind of sit with the fact and be comfortable with the fact that these two are going to be under market rent for a substantial period of time. Now, what you want to do here is run your cash flow numbers with these rents and make sure that they work for your model, that they still cash flow. If they do not, you might want to think about passing on this property unless you are comfortable waiting for these leases to expire and renew. So this is something you always want to look at when you're evaluating a property, right? Do the leases impact my cash flow based on how long remains on those leases when you're inheriting a tenant? So that's it for this week. We'll be back next week with more. Thank you for your time and attention. Have a great weekend.